This week on Hermitcraft. If I build you the storage room, if Tango ever calls it cute again, you have to defend it. Welcome to the Hermitcraft Recap, my name is Pixhorifs, our writer is LoyXP, captions on this video were provided by Liara, and at this point I don't even read that opening line every week, I just load it onto a goat horn and play it whenever we need it. The other distant sounds you hear are the server ramping back up after everyone who participated in the charity event makes their triumphant return and gets back to whatever the heck they were doing. Shops appear, diamonds disappear, and goat horn sound bites ring from every corner of the server, meaning the job of subtitling these recaps has now entered hard mode. But with that out of the way, let's take a look at all the events and mishaps that occurred on the Hermitcraft server this week. I know this is a little puppet hole. Ah. This is so good for your Muppet Ooh. skin! Ah. Starting with Etho, who seems to be slowly cornering the market in custom Funko Pops. If you're willing to sell, I'd, I'd buy one from you. Okay, what are you thinking about Pan? What is happening? <laughs> I want that horn. I do actually want that one. I was really sad you bought it before me. He agrees to sell one to Good Times with Scar, but Scar is really there to goggle at Etho's latest storage floor. As in, the floor is literally the storage. So let's say I need cobblestone. I look in here, I find the cobblestone. And it switches to it. Whoa! And there we go. So it's almost like, it's like having a, a chess system that never runs out of space. It makes a change from the floor being Ravages, which is the key to his Frogger minigame inside the Froglight shop. Actually, the Froglight endeavor is more of a mini shop within a larger game at this point, because there's now a drip leaf parkour section, the road slows you down with honey blocks, and a zombie on the grassy median prevents you from lingering for too long. It's killed B00 a few times, which is usually a good sign that your game is working as intended. Oh, oh snap. <laughs> <laughs> so close! But while Etho's Houston Freeway Simulator is not quite open for business, the Hermits entertain themselves with CubFam 135's large and varied horn-based soundboard. Truly, it is impressive that the man convinced people to buy their own voice lines from him. Oh my god, Keep hi. slapping, mate! Keep oh slapping! Oh my god, hi! <laughs> Stop. So, let's go say hello, shall we? Oh my god, hi! Oh my god, hi! <laughs> hi! Hang on, hang on, hang on. Well, I don't we have, have to communicate I'm... via horns! I'm eating a curly whirly right now, but it's nice to see Exuma. That's all I've got. Oh, well, that's made me want a curly whirly now. She'll have to make some serious green to pay for this growing voice line collection, which is why False expands the pit below her base circle to include a cactus farm. It's one fewer client Pearlescent Moon gets for her dye shop, but luckily Wells Knight is here staining his own terracotta since the hardened clay merchants have not organized yet. Wells's castle is actually just within the reach of the goat horn from the commercial district, so people trying out the voice lines they're buying is making it feel like his walls are screaming. You've been hearing me play these the last five minutes? It's been more like ten. But, uh... Well, you know, that seems like a you problem, Wells. You know, you're building your base so close to the shopping districts and everything, you know, it's... Granted, Wells recently overhauled his entire audio setup, including a new microphone, but only a hint from Pearlescent Moon helps him tweak the in-game audio settings. Otherwise, over the three videos he posts this week, Wells decorates a significant portion of his castle keep, including building an actual bedroom for his highness, as opposed to literally sleeping in the wall. I am getting really tired of sleeping right here. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, let's be honest, it's not a great bedroom. With his business growing louder, Cub toys with the idea of setting up a Horn of the Month subscription service, and since his mailbox finally arrived, he can actually have the goods auto-sent through the mail. So we're gonna have to wait on the tutorial on how to use this thing, but I know sort of what I want to use it for. Cubfan also briefly considers how an autocrafter would interact with the written book copying mechanic, essentially inventing a printing press along with copy protection but then realizes he's not the one holding the book and quill permit, so there's a lengthy conversation with Vintage Beef somewhere in his future. Key thing was this, is that you cannot copy the copies that come out of this. Maybe they could hire people to write poetry, and they could sell... You can make your own currency with this. Print out a finite number of books. That's pretty awesome, so I think the implications of this system are pretty big. He might find Beef enjoying the view from his second bedroom, which he establishes as part of his Mission Possible quest. I think I found a perfect spot for a bedroom. This is a bedroom with a view. He chooses to accept his new mission, which is a trade-up quest of epic proportions. And trade your way up to a diamond block using as many hermits as you need. That's a cool mission. And speaking of trading, he did save a villager at his farmhouse, who moves into the house to become Roy, his personal chef. Beef is trading more than sticks at the big wood shop, where he sets up his netherwood nook and secretly hopes people don't want to buy it all immediately. And we'd say it's bold of him to put lava in a wood shop, but hey, fire tick is off, right? Seymour, the house is on fire! No, 
bother, it's just the Northern Lights. At least False Symmetry has carved a big enough river to throw himself into if he does set himself on fire, and hopefully it'll prevent any Houdini-level horses from totally escaping his new stable. It's safe to say Iskel is pretty smitten by the goat horn craze. He challenges Mumbo to join him in creating a story using only goat horn sound clips, or as we've been calling it, the Mad Lads play Mad Libs. It's a made up tale. It's a total fabrication. It never happened. Embracing the chaos has been Iskel's whole style, as he builds up his factory walls, adding shop fronts and lived in details to the adjoining apartment block exterior and on the opposite side, connecting it to the terrace of townhouses that will form his and Stress Monster's murder mystery game. Because Stress's side is already filling up with attractive Amsterdam architecture as she assembles the first few houses in the row. No, that looks good there. What do you mean it doesn't match? <laughs> the one thing yeah. that I've done today where I felt like, oh, I don't hate that, <laughs> and then you hate it. It's no surprise that she and Iskel have different opinions about lighting when Stress has been running the end rod shop successfully enough that it gets a neighbor. Joel Beans sends her a quick message to introduce the glowberry shop that's glommed onto the side of Neon, and in exchange, she moves Perry the Platypus to Joel's Japanese shrine gate to keep an eye on him, which we think makes him Tori the Tatapus. I got a clue how you got over here, cheeky thing. She isn't done forcing animals on people though, because her villagers keep spawning cats for Iskel to adopt. Our hope is that eventually he'll be the first person to get the complete catalogue advancement without even wanting to. Goat horns aren't the only way to sneak some sounds into someone else's base though. After Impulse moves the Bop and Go song to a play ahead note block combo instead of a music disc, just to simplify the redstone, he experiments with some other ways to mess with Skizzleman when he's not around to toot his own horn. What's this gonna do? Impulse is a, a bit of a genius, it turns out. <laughs> oh, love that one. That isn't why you'll find Impulse farming himself for play aheads this week, though. He wants them to detail a bulldozer outside his new quartz shop. Now we just need some shulker boxes to put the quartz in. This is gonna get expensive, isn't it? After a couple of weeks with a temporary stall, he sets up a quartz geode adjoining Vintage Beast's Basalt Emporium and stocks several shulker boxes with quartz blocks and items, helpfully labelled for anyone using the shulker tooltips mod. Naturally, when it becomes clear he's chopping his own head off with goofy death messages, Pearlescent Moon shows up and volunteers to be the executioner. For those less interested in dying, XB Crafted has been manufacturing absurd amounts of golden apples thanks to his new gold farm. And if they sell anything like golden carrots, XB will be raking in the profits. The store has already earned him and Beef a couple of trophies, but they hatch a scheme to scam their way up the food chain by buying out each other's shop stock. You know what? Maybe we boost these up a little, a little more. Maybe four diamonds per stack in a little bit. I mean, everybody wants everything to get more expensive. I'm down. Meanwhile, with a couple of minigames now popping up on the server, naturally XB decides to challenge Corallis, and we learn that Corallis is better at clicking, while XB is better at dropping. I'm never ready, I'm left-handed. <laughs> <laughs> left-handed? Okay, so... Oh, I didn't know you could do that. While the trophy cheesing would only benefit Azumavoid, who is selling the commemorative cups, X may have ones not as easily tricked coming to the server soon. After all, doing the most capitalism is only one accomplishment a hermit could do. For example, partaking in Iskel's missions is something to remember, and we do hope Azuma actually remembers whose base it is he left a Vex noises machine at, because he sure didn't tell us. I, I got something for the both of you, because the most expensive oh. firework oh. rocket. What? Gosh. Well done, Cub. <laughs> that is huge. Hang on, hang on. While these plans are still in the oven, Azuma aims to resolve his ever-present storage issues and brings back the redstone auto-sorter from last season, but with a shulker auto-crafter attached to one side. He will need all the cargo space he can to keep all the slime blocks his new farm is outputting. So far, so good. They seem to stay close to the note block, and after they've dropped off some slime balls, they can kind of hang out in this area too. iJevin, for example, builds a whole shulker shell farm on the outskirts of the end, as to never have that problem again. Tutorial in the description, not my farm. I am a titan of industry check this out i have copied a tutorial with his goal being to craft up firework rockets on mass jevin also recreates the old reliable creeper farm of his with full intent of combining it with a sugarcane harvester somehow and now with auto crafting he won't even need to lift a finger to get fresh rockets from afking zombie cleo in the meantime skyrockets in sales the cat cafe bookstore easily leaps above the thousand diamond profit goal earning cleo the shiny trophy and the first place on the leaderboard at which point they realize that they won't even need a vintage beef to just buy their own stock. Here's my question. We're just counting the diamonds that we get from our shops, right? If I buy my own products, does the money that I put into my shop 
also count towards this total, because I can definitely cheese this system. Before their leader's maliciously secured, Cleo arranges some more legitimate business, though definitely does it through spam email. After they send out a book offering armor stand service and armor stand tutoring, not only does Etho reply wishing to become their understudy, Corallis is willing to labor barter in exchange for Cleo introducing miniature crabs to the more rocky side of his villa shoreline. But you know those little, like, those little, like, uh, raving crab from the crab dance? You want me to make little tiny crabs? Like, the, the crab themselves is in, the, like, like mm -hmm. the music video, they're, like, super red. Having made a few surprise sales, Joe Hills restocks on some of the low-tier books from Cleo's supply of librarians before the Big Wood Collective meets up and decides to commission a grand opening fireworks display from Cubfan. How about when you guys finally moved in, we do a big opening, you know? I like Party it. Party is, like yeah, it absolutely. Why a not? Ribbon cutting. I like it. All right. They send Joe in to negotiate, negotiate if you will, and he irons out a deal, then goes back to strip mining stone out of the Holmdel area and stashing it for Etho under the Shulker Box shop. And while he may have mastered the art of placing blocks from a fixed camera angle, his takeoffs and landings might need a little work. Yeah! I mean, that's the real reward. Also the 100 diamonds. Oh yeah, it's funnier if I fly. <laughs> Now we're not sure on the timeline, but at some point recently, Smallish Beans took off to Japan, leaving us with a pre-recorded episode answering audience questions. As do you use any weird keybinds in Minecraft? I don't think I do. I think they're all default. Yeah, look. The best information we can offer here is that he shared his crispy chili beef recipe, shows a clip of him younger and totally rocking it at a battle of the bands, and also is nowadays binging Gossip Girl while working on builds and material gathering. You will have to watch it yourself for any juicier gossip. Girl. Do you ever miss your old skin? No, it was ugly. The talk around these parts is Skizzleman has triggered a raid, and Gemini Tay is here to help deal with the consequences, while Grian is here to convince everyone to avoid the consequences. Yeah, yeah, you gotta ignore it for longer. See, with with long-term issues like this, you've really gotta commit. Just don't come back for like, I don't know, a couple months. Oh, come on! Gem's play here is to try and just capture the last pillager of the raid in a hole somewhere, but it turns out the ground on this side of Magic Mountain is mostly made of cactus farm, so the three have to actually fight wave after wave of combatants. The moral of the story here is put Grian into the cactus farm. That was awesome! I think, I think we all learned a valuable lesson. When you have a problem, you should hit it head on. Gem's main quest for this week, however, is to figure out what it is she's actually doing with her side of the shoreline outside of letting the fog consume her, judging by these shader shots. The vibes aren't helped by her most recent build being named the Collector's House. The vibes are helped by the palm trees, though. Needs a lot of details, but it's coming together. The main thing throwing a shadow over Gemsmouth is good times with Scar's unprompted ore mountain, now rivaled by a similar ore block cone belonging to Grian. The reveal that the thing is not only shorter than Scar's one, but also hollow is pretty hilarious. Oh my Sorry. god, this is actually See? solid. See? Uh -oh. Wait a second! <laughs> you made a, like, a little thick room wow. here to try to pretend <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. solid. <laughs> How dare you? Whoops. There is, mind you, a much better way of keeping your possessions organized, and Etho is kind enough to show Scar his new and improved storage system that surely would help with the ever-growing chest pile at Scar's base. Wait, how did you do that? It was magic. Too bad by that moment Mr. Good Times has already put all his loot into a brand new cargo car and went to great lengths to decorate the insides in great detail. Maybe his next train will be more organized. We can only hope. I'm worried that I might get storage system envy or I'll look down on my system. Also, I want to buy these. In his own redstone expertise, Grian is on the way to building up the server's prime prismarine farm, but gets completely sidetracked and also run over when Etho invites him to try out the Frogger minigame. He then also breaks it. I, okay, I was like on my way back and I nudged one and then, and then I ruined it. Not a big deal. It kind of oh. is. It kind of looks he like a big deal. Tears. While Etho's Frogger game has been turning roads into honey, Rendog has been doing the same with lakes. Excavating the wheat field that's been supplying his packed mud until now, Ren carves away the landscape to replace it with a honey block basin that you probably wouldn't want to go swimming in without your spacesuit. That is, uh, that's the lake done. Wow, we did this in one cut. Hey, we're getting better at this. And finally, there's Mumbo, who continues to spawn-proof the nether ceiling below his gold farm by sleeping it all away. Once the farm is operational, he has to buy the Sweeping Edge enchantment from Corallis, who decides he'd actually prefer to give it away than to sacrifice an inventory slot for the 19 gold bars Mumbo gives him. And once he's generated enough gold blocks to sell, Mumbo can't think of many actual uses for gold. 
This has cost me a diamond to do these gold bars, but by Jove does it look good. It's still worth putting up for sale though, so Mumbo follows the trend of shops that look like they're pulling resources out of the ground, at least when Scar and Iskel aren't distracting him with goat horns. WHAT IS HAPPENING?! What is happening, Scar? I'm never gonna sleep. WHAT IS HAPPENING?! <laughs> I'm leaving! <laughs> With a craggy rock formation built, a crane on top extracting the raw gold, and a minecart encircling the whole thing, Mumbo sets up a pressure plate which rolls out the shop's stock in a chest minecart and sends it off again when you leave, making it less gold rush and more gold roll at a pretty casual pace. And that's about it for this week's recap. Our writer is Loy XP, and my name is Pixorus. Captions on this video were provided by Liara. Don't forget to leave a like while you're still here and subscribe so you won't miss future recaps. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.